the tunnel started to die down. So we needed a new church to go to every Sunday. And the Latin Quarters, or LQ, was it. After one Sunday night service at LQ, we went to Nori's crib in West New York, New Jersey, for an after party with some females. I left early because I wasn't into all that wild after party stuff no more. I didn't make it more than four blocks in my Range Rover before I got pulled over by a New Jersey squad car for no damn reason. Oh, I forgot. I was black and driving an expensive car. The cops asked me for my license and registration. The young Latino officer recognized me. Prodigy, is that you? He asked. Yeah, what's up? I said. What's the problem? Did I do something wrong? No problem. We saw the Georgia plates and wanted to check everything out, the officer said. I'd recently bought a range from a kid, Loke, in Atlanta, who was connected to a tag car operation that bought cars off delivery trucks before they reached the dealership. I couldn't resist the dirt cheap price. 10000 bucks for a brand new black on black 4.6 range. The Latino officer's partner shined a flashlight on my window stickers and VIN number tag. Don't worry, we just want to check your VIN number on your engine to make sure it matches the one on your windshield because the windshield tag is falling off, he explained. Damn. I had taken the reins to the car wash earlier that day, and while cleaning my windshield and dashboard, they knocked my tag loose. Pop your hood open and then we'll get you out of here. This was about to get bad. An all-black plastic 9mm with a rubber grip and laser sight was in the engine next to the battery. Two minutes later, the white cop said the code for gun to the Latino. Step out the vehicle, please, the Latino cop said. Turn around with your hands behind your back. I'm sorry, but you have a gun in your engine. We have to arrest you. They read me my rights searched my truck, and found three nickel bags of weed in a jacket one of my boys left in the back seat. Fuck. They put me in a squad car and took me to the West New York precinct. The next morning, Kiki and Uncle Lenny bailed me out. As I was leaving the courthouse, two detectives walked up. Albert Johnson, we need to talk. Please step into the office. Shit. Where'd you get this truck from? One of the D's asked after seating me in the office. Damn, it's over now. I bought it from some guy in Atlanta, I said. He was selling it, so I bought it. Do you know the guy you bought it from? No, it said for sale in the window, so I negotiated a price. Well, this truck is stolen, the detective said. The tags don't match. Our people check the engine parts and all the tags match except one. This is the best tag job we've seen. You know you bought a tag car, right? Don't lie, we already know. Hell no, I make music for a living, I said. I don't have to buy stolen cars, I got money. After 30 minutes of interrogation, they grew tired of trying to convince me to snitch, put the cuffs on, and rearrested me. They told Kiki and Uncle Lenny that I was now being charged with Grand Theft Auto, and I would have to wait till tomorrow to see the judge again. The next day, the judge hit me with a $150,000 bail. I spent a few days in Newark County Jail until Steve Rifkin bailed me out. It was my second gun charge and my first stolen car. My lawyer Irv Cohen and I decided to take it to trial. I can't elaborate on the particulars here, but during the trial... Irv approached me in the court hallway. Kid, you're a lucky son of a bitch, Irv said after presenting our case to the judge and DA at the trial hearing. They're dropping the charges to a misdemeanor. You just have to plead guilty to marijuana and pay a fine. I was relieved and happy as hell. The only problem was there was about 30 camcorder tapes in the back of the range, including footage of Killer Black, the Scarface Twin, Yammy, Remodeling our house in Freeport, classic studio sessions, sex tapes of groupies, all sorts of rare priceless memories. I need my tapes from the back of the truck, 
I said. Listen, kid, Earl said sternly. Whatever's in that truck, forget about it. Walk away. It hurt my heart that I lost all that footage. I gave E Money Bags $2,500 for a B he produced for the Murder Music soundtrack, which he put toward the Silver Navigator. Soundtrack Studios was becoming too expensive, so I made a deal with our engineer Steve Sola and the owner of a cheaper studio in Long Island called Music Palace. I started spending the night at Music Palace because I was working too late to drive upstate to Pomona every night. Green Eyes, Mike DeLorean, E Money Bags, and his homeboy Majesty would swing through. I bounced over to Queensbridge the following day for the YBE video shoot with BG from Cash Money. The owner of New York Furs, Irvin, lent me 15 of his best fur coats, chinchillas, minks, and mink hoodies. He looked out for me with the furs because I paid him to make 10 Buttersoft, infamous records leather jackets with leather bandanas to match with some of the money Ron Artest invested into the company. Although I didn't request it, Lau Records hired a jeweler to come to the set with a bunch of jewelry for me to wear, even though I had my own. Baby, Juvenile, BG, and a bunch of their boys showed up while a video director, Little X, was setting up shots. BG pulled me to the side and asked if I could get my hands on some diesel, which is heroin. So I sent drawers to buy two bundles of dope. BG took the bundle straight to the bathroom. It was the first time a New York rapper did a song and video with cash money. A rumor went around that I was robbed outside the video shoot for $300,000 worth of jewels. The jewelry that Loud Records had rented for the shoot. The story even made the newspapers. I won't elaborate for legal reasons, but can you believe that the jury company thought that I had something to do with the situation. I wonder what would make them think that. <laughs> a week after the video shoot, Green Eyes had a birthday party at a sports bar on the corner of Liberty Avenue next to the Van Wick Expressway in Jamaica, Queens. I bumped into bags. He told me that he had drama with some dudes who might show up at the party. He pulled a mini forty five caliber out of his pocket. I'm going to lay a nigga down tonight if I see one of them, he said. I had my nine milli on me, so if it was going to be something, then somebody would definitely get laid down and out. The day after Green Eye's birthday party, I contacted a hot producer named Seven to get beats for bars and hooks and myself. Seven had well-known hits with Ja Rule and Ashanti. He told me to meet him at the Crack House, a studio owned by Irv Gotti and Ja Rule. When I arrived, I saw Irv Gotti and a couple of his Murder, Inc. artists, Cadillac Ty and Black Child. I knew Irv Gotti from seeing him at industry functions, but we were never cool. But I knew his R&B singer, Shanti, and her mother, Tina, very well from my grandmother's dance school. When Ashanti was 16 or 17, her mother gave me a copy of Ashanti's demo and wanted me to sign her. She sounded amazing. But I wasn't mentally ready to do the label thing. A couple of years later, Irv Gotti and Ja Rule signed her and blew her up. Irv brought me into the studio, where Seven played me some beats. I got a call from E Money Bags, so I went into the hallway to talk to him. When I told Bags that I was at Irv's studio, he said, Tell that nigga Irv that E Money Bags said, What up? He know me. I told Irv, and his face instantly changed. Like he was nervous all of a sudden. What's that about? I wondered. I made a copy of one of Seven's beats and bounced back to the Music Palace studio to meet Balls and Hooks, Green Eyes, and Steve Sola. Late that night, Green Eyes said he needed to talk. He complimented me on infamous records and told me to stop hanging out with bags. He didn't tell me why or by who. He just said to stay away because bags was about to be hit. Bags was hype about getting his navigator. Come with me to the dealership in Long Island, he said at the studio one afternoon, just after Green Eyes told me to stop hanging with him. They're giving out good deals for luxury cars. We hopped on the Long Island Expressway and headed to Champion Motors. On the way, 
Bags broke down the whole story about the connection between Irv Gotti, Ja Rule, and Supreme. Bags told me Irv was a neighborhood DJ at park jams and block parties back in the day. And Irv and Ja were just two studio gangsters. Irv Gotti and Ja Rule, they were the herbs in the hood. And now Supreme's got them under his wing, Bags said. Before I gave Bags money for the song he did for my murder music soundtrack, he was planning to buy a tag car from this girl named Z, who went to my grandmother's dance school and sold tag cars for Supreme. Capone from QB bought a white buggy out Benz from her a few months prior. Bags gave Z a thousand dollars for a down payment, but when he got the twenty five hundred from me, he decided he wanted his money back to get a legit car. A navigator instead. You got to take that up with Prane, Z told him. Because he told me not to give you anything back. Supreme brushed Bags off like he was a punk. Bags was a member of a Jamaica Queens gang in the late 80s called the Young Guns. That had a big brawl with another gang from Jamaica, the Lost Boys, at Sunrise Multiplex. Somebody was shot in the eye and killed inside the theater. Bags was the shooter. He's the reason why that movie theater has metal detectors to this day. Bags told me he was coming out of the Coliseum on Jamaica Avenue one day and saw Prem parked in a Land Rover with a dude named Black Just, another well-known member of the Supreme team, in the Rover's passenger seat. Bags proceeded to shoot up the Rover with bullets, learning later that he missed Prem and shot Black Just in the upper inner thigh. Instead of driving Just to the hospital, Prem drove him 10 minutes away to the hood and told somebody else to take him 10 minutes back so the D's wouldn't question him. Black just bled to death, but if Prem would have dropped him off at Mary Immaculate Hospital right around the block from the shooting, just might have lived. 50 Cent felt the same way about Irv and Ja, Bag said, and he didn't get along with Prem either. So when 50 first came on the rap scene with songs dissing Irv and Ja, Preem put a hit on 50, and that's why 50 got shot up. Bags knew that Preem put a hit on him, too, for killing Black Just, but he said he was going to kill Preem first. Now I understand what Green Eyes was telling me and why Irv Gotti looked like he seen a ghost when I told him I was on the phone with Bags and why Ja Rule was acting tough on that Limp Biscuit tour. I was thinking as Bags spoke. He figured he had Preem to protect him. E Money Bags went on to tell me how he was connected with Tupac. Bags' homeboy Majesty and Majesty's brother Big Stretch were blood cousins with Young Noble from Tupac's group The Outlaws. So they all hung out on a regular basis in the early 90s. Tupac was so tight with Big Stretch that he'd given him appearances in two of his movies, Above the Rim and Bullet. While he was in New York shooting Above the Rim, Tupac had also befriended some dudes from Brooklyn, Jamaican Jackson and Johnny Lynchman, as well as a few other Brooklynites like Biggie Smalls, Little Sean, and the whole Bad Boy clip. Bags explained that shortly after the filming of Above the Rim was complete, Tupac, Jamaican Jackson, and some others went to hang out at a nightclub where they found groupies to bring back to Pac's hotel. One of the females called the cops, claiming that Tupac and his friends raped her and the judge sentenced him to a year and a half in prison. During the trial, the press questioned Tupac outside the courthouse about his co-defendants, Jamaican Jackson and others. I don't know them dudes. They not my friends, Tupac said. Jamaican Jackson and his friends didn't like that very much. While Tupac was out on bail, he set up a recording session at Quad Recording Studios in Manhattan with rapper Lil Sean. Stretch, went with Pac to Quad that night and noticed a man leaning against a street pole reading a newspaper right in front of the studio door as they arrived. Stretch told Bags that when he and Pac walked inside, the man followed them into the lobby, gun drawn, along with two other gunmen. They went straight for Pac's jury. Pac had two Glocks tucked in his pants and tried pulling them out, but shot himself in the groin. The gunman opened fire on Pac, raising him on the head and a few other spots before running off. Stretch told Bags that he and Pac went up in the studio 
with Biggie Puff and Lil Sean saw Pac bleeding and were all in shock. Bags then told me that they found out who shot Pac in the lobby that night. Bags and Stretch visited Pac on Rikers Island a lot, and they told Pac who ordered the hit and who took it, so Pac knew exactly what was going on. He knew that Biggie and Puff had nothing to do with it. But when E Money Bags and Stretch explained what happened, Pac told him that he planned to use the situation to sell a lot of records. Bags explained who was behind it, but Pac said he just wanted to start controversy, and he planned to use Biggie and Puff and turn his gunshot wounds into a marketing and promotion scheme. Wow. As Bags finished the Pac saga, we pulled into the dealership. Bags ordered a silver navigator with gray leather interior, TV, and a Sony PlayStation. In his navigator the next day, Bags passed me his pager and told me to look at the message. It was from Ja Rule's label mate, Cadillac Ty. They're over here right now. Come get them. Cadillac was referring to Ja and Irv. You see that, right? Bags turned to me and said, They old man lined them up for me. We just robbed them niggas for their chains. The year 2000 zoomed by. I turned around and it was 2001. I was in Harlem rolling down 125th Street on my way to the Triborough Bridge when I slowed down to get a good look at a brand new 2002 Yukon Denali XL. I'm buying one of those immediately, I said to myself. Two months later, I bought an all-white Denali XL with gray leather seats. My man Gotti from QB and I was sitting in the truck when a new Jay-Z song called Takeover came on the radio. The beat was hot, so we turned it up and heard Jay-Z dissing Nas and me. I was wondering what was taking Bitch Boy so long. I thought, let the games begin. The radio station Hot 97 was promoting its annual Summer Jam concert at Nassau Coliseum. Marv Deep wasn't performing, so we paid it no mind. The June day of Summer Jam, Havoc was in the basement in Freeport making beats while the rest of the crew was in the living room playing 007 on PlayStation in two-player mode. I got a phone call from Ella G, who was at Summer Jam with a bunch of his friends from Brooklyn. Yo, P, this bitch-ass nigga just tried to play you during his show, G said. What you mean? I asked. Jay-Z, I told you that picture was going to come back to haunt you one day, G said. Jay had the picture of you when you was a kid dressed like Michael Jackson up on the screen. I started laughing. It sounded funny as hell. I had to admit, <laughs> that was a good joke. In the song, Takeover, Jay had a line about me. You was a ballerina. I got the pictures. I seen you. Drop shook ones, then you change your demeanor. We don't believe you. You need more people. But anybody who went to my grandmother's dance school has seen a picture of me when I was eight years old dressed like Michael Jackson. Jay-Z couldn't confront the issue that started our whole drama, so he diverted the people's attention with a joke. The debate was about Jay not being active in the rap beef with Snoop and Tupac and how he waited years until Tupac and Biggie were murdered to start running his lips about New York been soft ever since Snoop came through and crushed the buildings. I'm trying to restore the feelings. That's the reality that Jay has to deal with when we all get tired of laughing at me in 1982. Eight years old, dressed like Mike. But I did like the tactic that Jay used. It was pretty slick. Nas dropped a song called Build and Destroy a few months later, and in the lyrics, he took shots at me all of a sudden. Prodigy used to be my man through all the robberies. At the end of the song, he said something about how he was still cool with me and that I just needed to stop hanging around certain people, those people being... Called Mega and Bars and Hooks. Nas went from playing me close in the studio next door to asking me to be on his QB project to intercepting my artist from Queensbridge because he didn't know who the new talent was to calling my crib after 10 years to playing a part in my movie to Prodigy used to be my man. What? Was this fool schizo? People in Queensbridge told me that Nas made that song because he was mad at me for doing a song with Cormega, in which Mega took shots at Nas in his verse. 
Mega didn't like Nas ever since Nas booted him out of the firm and had started dissing Nas for a living. But I didn't diss him. Mega did. Why you not confronting Mega? I wondered of Nas. You scared? Why didn't you fight DeLorean when he choked you up in the studio? You scared? I asked a brave heart for my chain back. Bullshit. I ain't asked for nothing. I went and got mine's back by myself when some of my boys from QB told me not to. Why would Nas diss me in that song? I didn't realize the answer until months later. Nas was being just as tactical as Jay-Z. After Summer Jam, I started going bonkers on Jay-Z with diss songs. And Nas was actually jealous because my beef with Jay-Z was getting a lot of publicity. On a Friday night the following winter, Jay-Z went on Funkmaster Flex's Hot 97 radio show, freestyling with his new recruits, Beanie Siegel, Young Guns, and Freeway. Balls and Hooks, Green Eyes, E-Money Bags, Majesty and I were at the Music Palace studio. Jay's boys sounded real good until I heard Beanie take an indirect shot at Mob Deep. Something about, I creep on your quiet storm. To top it off, Jay had some nigga named H Money Bags rhyming with them. E Money Bags started spazzing. I had a private number to the radio station, and after about 80 rings, somebody picked up. Yo, this is Prodigy, I said. Let me speak to Jay Z. Jay just got on the elevator and left. You just missed him. The person on the phone said. Go catch him and tell him Prodigy on the phone. Okay, I'm going to try. Hold on. Five minutes later, Jay got on the phone. What's up? Jay said. Yeah, what up, nigga? I said. Hold on, somebody want to talk to you. Bags was asking for the phone, so I handed it over. Yo, what's up? It's E-Money Bags. How you got some dude up there using my name? You know me, nigga. Who the fuck is H-Money Bags? So, what are you trying to say? Jay asked. What am I trying to say? You know what the fuck time it is with me, nigga. Don't try to act like you don't know how I rock. Bags said. Bags went to high school with Jay, and they know each other very well. This is what you called me for? Jay replied. Oh, now you acting tough. Bags said. You tough now? You know I'm going to see you now, right? Say no more then, Jay said. Say no more? All right, so when I see you, you know what it is. Say no more. Jay said. The following Friday, I called Flex and asked if E-Money Bags, Nori, myself, and Nas could come to the station later that night and do a freestyle session just like Jay and his team did. We wanted revenge. Flex agreed. Bags called Nas so he can come with us, and Nas said he would. While we were on our way to the station, we called Flex, and he put us live on the air. As we crossed the 59th Street Bridge, Nas emailed Bags, backing out. Yo, I ain't coming. Just go up there and tell everybody who the real king of New York is. Bags read the message to me while I was driving. Maybe Nas was scared we were going to do something to him because he had just dissed me on his song, but we weren't. The real king of New York. Nori met us in front of the station, and we linked with Flex in the lobby. Thanks for coming up, but my boss just called and told me to cancel the show, Flex said. I can't let y'all up, because they think it's going to cause some beef. No matter what we said, Flex kept saying that he can't do it or he'd get in trouble. Outside, a Lincoln Town car pulled up, and five dudes with plastic cups of Hennessy in their hand hopped out, screaming, hey, Yo, what's up? I grabbed my hammer on my waist. Yo, we from Far Rockaway. We heard you on the radio saying y'all were coming to the station, so we came to hold you down. I told him that Flex wouldn't let us on the air. Fuck them Rockefeller faggots. We came up here to wait outside and creep on anybody trying to creep on y'all. We from Far Rockaway, Pete. Far Rock got your back. Soon after the disappointment at Hot 97, the co-owners of The Source, Dave Mays and Ray Benzino, told me that the new Source Awards we're about to take place in California. Look, you know this clown Jay-Z is running around fronting like shit is sweet, I told Benzino. 
If y'all want us to perform at the award show, then I need you to hook us up with 30 passes and seats for my boys. I promise we won't hurt Jay inside the venue or ruin your show. I just want to show this clown and everybody else what kind of power Mall Deep has. Please do this for me. Benzino paused for a moment, then said okay. The whole 12th Street crew got on a plane to Los Angeles. Havoc, Twin, Nitty, Godfather, Gotti, Free High, Little Lord, YG, Kiko, Derek from the Bronx, Mike DeLorean, Mr. Bars, Green Eyes, Larry the movie director, Fly, Prince Guard, me, and like 14 others. It was the first time on a plane for a lot of them. We stayed at a hotel across the street from the House of Blues on Sunset Boulevard. While we were stopped at a red light on our way back to the hotel from dinner, I looked over at a payphone on the sidewalk to my right and couldn't believe my eyes. It was our homeboy Draws from Queensbridge. What the hell was Draws doing in California on a random payphone? I rolled down the van window and yelled, Draws, get your ass in the van. Yo, thud. I came out here with Thun and them dudes left me stranded. Draws, who only spoke Thun language, explained. Thun, this is crazy. I bumped into y'all like this. Thun. He was saying that he came to Cali with Nas and Nas had left him. Draws was wild. The nerves in his hand were damaged from being shot. So his palms were always sweaty and he carried a washcloth everywhere. Back at the hotel... Draws told me how he was calling his man Rain at the payphone. You need to meet my thun Rain, Draws said. Thun got crazy connects in the music industry. I can't even get us some guns out here. Thun got a lot of ties in L.A. When he said guns, that sparked my interest. After about an hour, Draws told me his man 40 Glock was outside the hotel and Rain had arranged for him to bring us the hammers. In front of the hotel on Sunset Strip, a dude with cornrows introduced himself. What up, cuz? I'm 40 Glock. He's my little homies, he said, motioning to his boys. 40 was cool. I could tell he was a crip because of how he spoke and he and his homies had on blue. 40 Glock and his people met us at the Shrine Auditorium for the Source Awards the following day. We all had on custom-made football jerseys, with Hennessy, E&J, Seagram's, Thug Passion, Bacardi, and other liquor names embroidered on the front and our names on the back so our crew would stand out in the crowd. Little Kim flew out to perform the Quiet Storm remix with us and brought the whole Junior Mafia crew. Our dressing room was connected to Lil' Kim's, so my crew drank and smoked with them until taking our seats two rows from the front of the stage at Showtime. Tupac's group, the Outlaws, was seated directly in front of us. It was our first time seeing each other since the beef. And because so many of my boys were there, I didn't want to make the Outlaws feel uncomfortable. So I made small talk with them to let them know it was all good now. The famous polo model, Tyson Beckford, was also seated in front of us. And he pulled out a gallon of Hennessy from under his seat then showed it to Havoc and me. We told him to pass us the bottle back and thugged out the whole gallon. I didn't drink that hardcore shit anymore, but I had to take care of my boys. When the Houston rapper Scarface, seated in the road to our left, saw my team drinking, he was like, What's up, man? As if he wanted a cup. So we poured him one. By the time I gave Tyson Beckford back his bottle, it was mostly gone. Mob Deep was the final act of the night. Smoke filled the stage with the thunder from the Quiet Storm intro, while Havoc slowly drove a caddy truck on stage and hopped out when his verse began. The crowd erupted. I hopped out along with Noid, who was holding a gown of Seagram's gin, jumping around as it spilled all over. After Havoc's verse, Noid opened the back door of the truck and assisted the Queen Bee Little Kim out while she spit her verse. Hey, yo, prodigy, tell him what it is, Dunn, Kim concluded. As I screamed, yo, it's the real. Our boys in the crowd were wailing like we were inside the tunnel back in NYC and the shrine went nuts. After my verse, a 
A gang of death row bloods came storming through the entrance and charged